So this is a lecture on section 4.1, nonlinear regression, and we're going to explore the idea today of what happens when you want to do a, re a regression between x and y, and it turns out the association is not linear. So far, pretty much every single time we fit an LSRL to a bunch of data, it's fit it pretty well. Now we're going to see the kind of the first case where what happens if the model is actually not linear. So here's an example that kind of works out that way. Um, this is the length of certain kind of fish. We're going to say length is the uh, explanatory variable, so that's going to be x. Weight is the response variable, that's y. So you'll kind of see over here, I've entered that data in my calculator, and we're going to make a scatter plot basically between length and width. And that scatter plot looks like this. It looks like this, and of course anybody kind of just looking at it would say, well, clearly that's not linear, right? It's definitely not a straight line. Um, it turns out I did a regression on it using linreg L1, L2, comma Y1. You notice the R value is actually relatively high, right? Um, if you just if you just looked at that, you might say, wow, the association is pretty strong. Um, but this certainly indicates that, boy, it certainly doesn't look linear to you. Here I did the same thing where I, um, the same scatter plot, but I fitted the LSRL to it. And notice um, it doesn't do a terrible job of fitting it. There aren't any points that have huge residuals. Um, but you'll notice that all of these points are above the LSRL, so are these points. But then all of these points are below the LSRL. So over here, we get a residual plot. And I think this is a good example of, we certainly would say this is a residual plot that shows a pattern, right? Um, so if you were to analyze the situation, you would say clearly the association is nonlinear because there is a pattern in the residual plot. I think we would clearly say this is, this is a pattern in the residual plot. Okay. Now, last chapter in chapter 3, we'd have, we'd have just stopped there, but now we're going to kind of explore this a little bit more. And what I've done here is I've actually gone back to the data and made what, what's called a transformation. Transformation. And what I've said is, you know, this involves fish and the length of the fish and the weight of the fish. And I have some sense that the weight of the fish, which is this one, has something to do with how big the fish is, like the volume of the fish. And when I think volume, think about like, well, imagine a fish was a cube. Usually volume is like length times width times height. But let's just kind of say, let's just cube the volume. So if this is x, what I've done over here is I've entered in, I've made L3 x cubed. And I did that because I had some sense that I wanted to compare not the length of the fish, but something to do with the volume of a fish. Okay, So you can actually see what I did down here is if you put the cursor blinking on L3 and then you type in L1 to the third power, it'll fill in all these numbers for you. You didn't have to kind of retype those. Okay, um, And then what I did over here is I made a scatter plot not of L1 and L2, but I made a scatter plot of L3 and L2. And remember L3 is essentially x cubed. This is really a scatter plot not <coughs> of x and y. X and y. It's not a scatter plot of that, it's a scatter plot of x cubed and y. So on this x axis we would label it length cubed and then we'd put weight up here. And then what I did here is I did a linear regression on x cubed and y. Okay, so I actually did linreg L3, which remember is x cubed, L2, that's plain old y, y1. And notice this is a much, much, much stronger correlation coefficient. Okay? And now you might say, well, let's actually take a look at this. This is a residual plot of length cubed and weight. And so it turns out, since there is no pattern in this residual plot, the relationship between x cubed and y is linear. Right? Since there is no pattern in the residual plot of x cubed and y, the relationship between x cubed and y is linear, which means that the model of uh, x cubed and y is a, is a good fit. And over here, I've redone the, uh, this is the same linear regression I did before, again using x cubed and y. And now let's think about what would a problem look like if I asked you to make a prediction. So what if I said, as an example, predict 
the weight of a fish 31 centimeters long. So then there's the length is 31. Now our model here is a little bit tricky. We're going to write down weight hat, that's still the same, is equal to 4.0658 plus 0.01467. Before we would just type in length, but now we have to type in length cubed. Right, because as we're doing between x cubed and y. So then it's 4.0658 plus 0 0.1467 31 cubed. And I get it about equaling 441 grams. Okay? So that's an example of doing a prediction using nonlinear data. Okay, let's look at another specific example. This is a thing involving mold. And so what they've done, yes, mold. That's right, I said mold. We're going to use time as the x, and actually what they've done here is we're going to use the mean colony size as y. So these numbers, they got this number by just averaging these numbers. So I've entered those numbers into uh, my calculator, and it turns out this is going to be an example of something called exponential growth. Exponential growth, and mold is a good example of that because mold colonies tend to grow on themselves. And kind of the definition of exponential growth is that uh, the response variable is multiplied each unit of time. Each, each increase in the explanatory variable. Think about that sentence we wrote before for every increase of one blank x, the y predicted y increases by blank. Well, now actually it's increasing by, it's, we're not adding something to it every time like you do with the idea of rise over run and slope. We're multiplying by it. So you would say it's kind of doubling every hour or it's, you know, rather than getting 10 bigger every time, it's doubling every time, something like that. Okay. And mold tends to be an example of exponential growth. The classic one of that is bunnies, how the size of bunnies just kind of doubles over time. And sure enough, if you make a scatter plot of this data, you get something like this. Clearly not very linear. It kind of has what's just kind of this classic exponential pattern. Okay. I put them into lin reg, and even though, again, the R value is pretty solid, when you look at the linear regression on that, you would say, well, wait a second, the line sure does not do a great job of fitting it. Down here, I looked at the residual plot, and sure the residual plot has a pattern, which leads us to say that the relationship between, or the association, I should say, between time and colony size is nonlinear because there is a pattern in the residual plot. Okay, but now we actually did something a little bit goofy. I want to talk about this in a little bit of detail. What I've done here is it turns out there is a nice relationship between exponential growth and logs. So what I've done here is I can't show L1 in the calculator, but that's X. L2 is Y. What I did here is I replaced it with log of X and log of Y. And one of the things you're going to have to know eventually is that if you somehow suspect that exponential growth is the model, you replace X comma Y, you make a transformation, and you replace it with X comma log Y. And this is something you just have to know that that turns into exponential, an exponential model. And we'll talk about in class exactly why that is, and I'll show you the math. But if you just kind of memorize this, that is what you do when you suspect an exponential model. That's okay for right now. And again, we'll show the math in class. So up here, that's exactly what I did. I did a linear regression. I did lin reg on L1. That's x, but then L4, that's log of y. And then, of course, I would do y1. And notice this r value is pretty darn strong. So here's that exact thing again. This is, again, between x and log y. Okay, over here, I did the scatter plot with the LSRL. Okay, and notice, actually, again, while it's not perfect, it does a better job of fitting that transformed data than it did in the original xy data. This is a residual plot of x and log y. And I think we would say there's no pattern here. So since there is no pattern in the residual plot between x and log y, 
the relationship between x and log y is linear, and therefore the relationship between x and y is exponential. That's a complicated sentence. Let's see if we can kind of write that down. And voila, there it is. Since there is no pattern in the residual plot of x and log y, the association between x and log y is linear, which means the association between x and y is exponential. Not the greatest handwriting you've ever seen. Okay, so now let's talk about how you might actually use this to make a prediction. Okay, let's, as an example, predict the colony size at time equaling 30. So our model, remember this is in terms of x and log y, so if you were to write this down, it'd be log size hat, that's an important thing, nor y's size, is equal to negative 0.2131 plus 0 0.0 six, three, six times time. Okay, now a little bit tricky. Now we plug in 30 there, so we get negative 0.2131 plus 0 0.0636 times 30. So that equals 1.6937. I kept a couple of, but remember that's log hat of size. Or log size hat. So how do you undo a log? Well, if you do just a plain old log, which is a common logarithm, that's log base 10, right? So if you raise both sides to the 10th, 10 to the that, then over here you get size hat is equal to 10 to the 1.6937, which is about equal to 49, okay? So that's a good example of making a prediction using, uh, using logs. Just to sum up, and I wrote some information here, we talked about the exponential model, which looks like a b to the x, y hat equals that, and we saw that if you think the exponential model is the way to go, you replace x, y with x comma log y, which often means you end up doing lin reg l1, l4, which is where y1 is, which is where log y is. I don't quite have time for this, although we'll do an example of, in class, but there's something, another thing called a power model, and that would be where you suspect it's something like x squared, x cubed, x to the 2.5, x to the 7th, whatever the case may be. In general, a power model is ax to the b. We notice the x is the base here, where over here in the exponential model it's the exponent. If you suspect a power model is the way to go, you replace xy with log x log y, which in practice often means you end up doing lin reg l3 l4 comma y1. And we'll do an example of a power model in class. It kind of works exactly the same way as the uh, as the mold example I just did with the exponential one, except you end up doing log x and log y. But the, the, the concept is still the same. If the residual plot of log x and log y has no pattern, then the relationship between log x and log y is linear, and therefore the relationship between x and y follows a power model. And there we go.